Hello and welcome to China Forum, the leading program for discussing the latest in trends and development in modern Chinese culture, politics, economics, and social issues. My name is Madeline Federley and I will be your moderator for our program today. Today on China Forum, we will be discussing the Chinese legal system and potentials for reform. We are happy to welcome our expert today, Professor Donald Clark. Professor Clark is a professor of law at the George Washington University Law School. A specialist in Chinese law, Professor Clark has also taught at the University of Washington Law School and the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, as well as practicing for several years at a major international firm with a large China practice. In addition to teaching, Professor Clark has published extensively in journals such as the China Quarterly and American Journal of Comparative Law. Moreover, he founded and maintains China Law, the leading internet listserv on Chinese law, writes the Chinese Law Professor's blog, and is co-editor of Asian Law Abstracts on the Social Science Research Network. Professor Clark, thank you for joining us today. Oh, glad to be here. To start us off, can you provide us with some background knowledge for those of us who might not be as familiar with China's legal structure as to how China has, you know, formed their legal apparatus, or what exactly, how you would describe China's legal system? Well, uh, China's current legal system is, in a sense, um, uh, a mix of uh, originally uh, three and now possibly four legal traditions. So, of course, there are actually still elements one can find of traditional Chinese law in the Chinese legal system. Uh, for example, the notion of a uh, suspended uh, death sentence is, uh, seems to be directly uh, rooted in Chinese legal history. Mm -hmm. Also, of course, China, uh, having, modern China having been founded in 1949 by the victory of the Communist Party of China, which was then uh, uh, allied with the Soviet Union, has many uh, elements of what we call Soviet law or socialist law in its uh, legal system. Um, in terms of uh, form, the Chinese legal system looks to uh, what we call continental law or the civil law system, that is the uh, general structure of law that's used in uh, continental Europe, France, and Germany uh, in, in particular. Uh, that's the system that they uh, inherited from the uh, pre-1949 uh, political regime. Uh, it's also been modeled to a certain extent on Japan. Uh, and then finally, uh, more recently, uh, Chinese legal scholars have uh, been very interested in the common law system and in particular how things are done uh, in the United States. And in terms of uh, matters such as uh, corporate law, uh, 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 securities law, uh, and um, some other elements such as um, uh, some elements of antitrust law, they've been taking some elements from uh, the United States in addition uh, to Europe. So uh, in terms of form, it looks most familiar to someone who understands uh, continental European legal systems. Uh, but uh, again, the, I guess the uh, attractive prestige of the American system has in at least some areas um, uh, brought uh, Chinese scholars to the United States to study how the U.S. does mm -hmm. things. Is this interest in the United States legal system mm -hmm. something that's relatively recent or does that trace back all the way to perhaps the founding of the PRC? Uh, I would say it's uh, relatively recent because uh, during the time when the uh, PRC was uh, kind of unavowedly, uh, so, uh, sorry, avowedly and unapologetically a socialist uh, and, and allied with the Soviet Union, then of course the Soviet Union was where they sent their students and they, you know, they didn't have uh, diplomatic relations with the United States. They had diplomatic relations with not very many European countries and so it wasn't possible to send a lot of students abroad to Europe or the United States even if they had wanted to, uh, but they didn't want to. So they would send students to the Soviet Union to understand you know, how to do a legal system for a planned economy because they had no intention of having a market economy. Um, obviously, uh, with China's economic reform and also with the uh, disintegration of the Soviet Union, uh, you know, interest in the Soviet way of doing things has uh, dropped uh, drastically. And uh, you know, Russia, the, you know, modern Russia has no real appeal to China uh, as a model. Um, since China has been engaged in this project of economic reform, therefore, they're much more interested in uh, doing things uh, the way market economy is doing them, trying to find out how to make a legal system uh, a fit with the demands of a market economy. And, um, you know, China's self-image 
at least the, the government of China's self-image, is as you know, a major leading nation in the world, if uh, not quite yet number one, then possibly number two. And uh, they would rather learn from uh, the United States, whom they perceive to be uh, the top dog uh, in the world. Mm. That makes sense, yeah. So when I think about trying to wrap my mind around China's legal system, mm -hmm. and I think about maybe the way it differs from our system here mm -hmm. in the United States, I would maybe describe our system as you know, the rule of law and China's system mm -hmm. as the rule of man. Mm -hmm. Is that a correct way to look at this when we're thinking about how these two systems differ? Well, I guess um, I think that could um, uh, perhaps be too abstract in general to, uh, to be a, um, you know, in order to really explain to someone where the differences lie. I guess I would prefer um, to say that uh, one of the big differences is, of course, the extent of uh, governmental involvement in both the legal system itself and in the um, actors uh, in the legal system. And uh, what I mean by that is, say, in China, uh, you still have heavy governmental involvement uh, in the economy and in actors in the economy, that is, state-owned enterprises and uh, other kinds of enterprises that, if not formally state-owned, uh, have significant governmental interest in them. And when those enterprises, for example, are the subject of uh, regulation by some governmental bodies or when they are the subject of, for example, a court suit, then uh, government has an interest, uh, an immediate uh, strong interest in a way that government, say, in the United States uh, might not. Um, the, the second way that government is heavily involved is in um, the kind of personnel uh, of the legal system itself, and in particular uh, in the court system. So um, courts in the United States uh, you know, are, are genuinely independent of the executive. Uh, now, you may have judges who, of course, have their own opinions. Uh, in the state system, many judges are elected. And, of course, uh, when people are elected, then they have to have campaign contributions. And when they have campaign contributions, they may incur certain kinds of, you know, uh, moral obligations they feel towards those who contribute to their campaigns. Um, but, uh, you know, for example, we don't have that in the federal system. And it is certainly, uh, I think, not the case um, uh, in the federal system or even in the state system in the United States that it is possible for, you know, a leading local politician, you know, to call up a local judge on the phone and say, I want you to decide this case uh, in this particular way, and then uh, for that to happen. Uh, that's considered uh, quite improper. Um, that is not considered, uh, well, it's fair to say it's not considered improper. Certainly, in China, the system is designed for that kind of thing uh, to happen, and for courts to ignore the... Um, uh, directives and requests of, say, the local party secretary um, would get them into trouble. Courts, uh, judges don't have security of tenure. Um, they could be uh, fired by essentially local political authority uh, at any time. Uh, court funding comes from the government at the same level. Uh, appointment of judges and firing of judges, again, comes from political authorities at the same level as the court. Courts exist in China on four levels. And so basically, courts are beholden to local political authority. Mm. Uh, they are not uh, independent and they are not accountable really to superior courts. And uh, that I think would be uh, the main difference, that there is really a vast scope for um, you know, behind the scenes, under the table, um, uh, interference uh, with the work of courts by local uh, officials and indeed, it might not even you know be called interference since it's kind of an expected mm -hmm. part of the way the system is supposed to work. Maybe guidance would be the better word. So, because of this guidance mm -hmm. or this involvement of personnel in the courts, mm -hmm. would an average Chinese citizen or does an average Chinese citizen see going through the legal apparatus as a viable way to express their grievances, mm -hmm. to come with injustices that have been acted upon them? Did that? Do they see it as a legitimate source of, you know, acquiring justice? Yeah, the actually, you know, some research has been done on that, and the results seem to be somewhat mixed. For example, there was some uh, research done which showed that people's first experience with courts, they tended to be more optimistic than later on. And the uh, mm -hmm. scholar who did this study described it as a condition of informed disenchantment, mm -hmm. that after people were exposed to the courts, then they became disenchanted. Uh, you know, because there's a lot of 
uh, you know, propaganda that encourages people uh, to go to courts and to take their uh, grievances to court and not take them to the streets. And indeed, it's, it's rather curious. The government seems to be of, and when I say government, I'm including the party in that, that is the party slash state. Um, the party state seems to be rather of two minds as to whether they want people to use the courts or not. Certainly, they don't want people out on the streets demonstrating. And uh, one would think that it would be to their advantage to try to turn political conflicts into legal conflicts and to get people off the streets uh, and into the courts. Um, and yet at the same time, uh, many times they take actions that discourage people from using the courts to resolve their problems. For example, uh, a few years ago when there was the case of uh, melamine poisoning uh, in milk, and uh, thousands of babies, I believe, got uh, uh, kidney stones. Some died as a result of this melamine poisoning. So a um, uh, similar case happened with the Wenchuan earthquake. Many buildings collapsed because of shoddy construction. In both those cases, um, a grieved uh, next of kin uh, of the deceased or of the sick babies attempted to uh, sue uh, various parties uh, in court to take these cases into court to sue whom they felt were responsible defendants. And in those cases, the government uh, responded uh, by issuing uh, orders to local lawyers not to take these cases, by sometimes um, threatening the parents uh, who were bringing these cases um, and uh, basically driving them out of the courts. So uh, and, and in other cases also, the government does not seem to be concerned with even you know, putting on the pretense of a fair trial. That mm -hmm. is, allowing witnesses for the complaining parties to testify. Sometimes the witnesses will be blocked from testifying. The, the, the uh, lawyers selected by the plaintiffs won't be allowed to represent them. Um, so it, it, uh, ev even though the government can control the outcome of the trial, of course, it doesn't even want the appearance of the trial to take place. Mm -hmm. So it's really, uh, I think the government uh, is, uh, it, it's hard to discern what exactly their view is on this, because sometimes they take steps that uh, encourage people to take their grievances out of the streets and into the courtroom, uh, and sometimes they take steps that encourage people to take them out of the courtroom and into the streets. When, when I look at China, at least, I kind of look at it in two parts, the rural areas mm -hmm. and then the eastern urban areas. Yeah. Would, and that's when I think about social issues, economic issues, even political issues. Is that the same for legal reform, or not necessarily reform, but just the legal system in general? If I'm a rural citizen, is my experience with the legal apparatus different than if I'm a Beijing citizen or a uh, Shanghai yes, I, citizen? Yes, I think it's probably very different. Okay. Um, the degree of uh, penetration of the state uh, into society is much, much higher in the cities uh, than it is in the countryside. Um, the, uh, say, just in terms of level of education of the judges, that's going to be much higher uh, in the eastern uh, part of China, mm -hmm. in the big cities, uh, than in the countryside. Um, I mean, if you're a, um, con if you're contemplating being a judge, uh, where are you going to want mm -hmm. to be a judge? I mean, <laughs> people in China like to live in, you know, the big cities in the east, and they don't generally like to live in the, uh, in the poor uh, rural uh, areas. So. Uh, rural people will have to travel much further uh, to get to a court. Uh, it will be much, much harder for them to find a lawyer. Uh, I forget what the statistics are, but there's some very large number of uh, counties in China in which there is not uh, a single lawyer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the number of lawyers in uh, Qinghai province uh, is probably, uh, you know, I don't know, but I would expect it's somewhere in the three digits. Uh, if that, you know, compared to the number of lawyers in, in, in wow. just Chaoyang District in Beijing by itself. Mm -hmm. So uh, generally, I think it's much more likely that rural authorities will uh, go their own way and not necessarily um, uh, obey central law when they do their governing of rural areas and that it would be much harder for rural residents uh, to do anything about it using the legal system. So speaking to the lack of maybe mm -hmm. professional competence with lawyers and judges or just the lack of them in general in these rural areas, is that, does that mean that being a lawyer in China is maybe not necessarily as prestigious as being a lawyer here in the United States? Mm. Or is that just simply a lack of a good education system? Um, yeah, I think 
it's hard to say exactly what the prestige of lawyers is um, uh, in China these days. I think it's probably uh, a mixed picture like it is in the U.S. You know, some people, we have a lot of lawyer jokes, you know, some people uh, hate lawyers, but on the other hand, it's, you know, it's considered to be a respectable, right. you know, profession. It's one of the things that, uh, you know, kind of traditional parents like you to be, a doctor, a lawyer, a CPA, something like that. Uh, so it's, you know, it's a respectable profession here. I think now uh, in China, certainly in the urban areas, um, it's a respectable profession, you know, relative to something like, uh, you know, real estate agent, you mm. know, which is a really not respectable right. uh, profession uh, in China. Um, in the, uh, you know, in the countryside, the problem is there just aren't that many ways, you know, for a lawyer to make money. I mean, the money is, is simply not there. Uh, the way to make money as a lawyer in the city, you know, is to be a commercial lawyer. And uh, there are still uh, lots of opportunities to, you know, to make a good living mm -hmm. uh, doing that at the senior level. Junior lawyers these days, uh, I'm told, aren't uh, aren't making very much. It's a, uh, it's not an easy uh, profession. Mm. So moving back towards mm. what the government's maybe vision for their legal apparatus is, mm. seems like it's really a mixed bag. We're not really sure, you know, what quite they what they want mm -hmm. really. But we do know that President Xi Jinping has stated in the speech he made in January that he indicating that he perhaps wants to take a stab at legal reform and he stated that China needs the establishment of an impartial and an authoritative socialist judicial system and that's a statement from this speech he made what exactly does that mean an authoritative socialist judicial system well uh... you know there used to be the joke that uh... Uh, I guess uh, socialist legality is to legality as the electric chair is to a chair. <laughs> um, and so, you know, when someone attaches the adjective socialist or, you know, with Chinese characteristics to something, it, you know, we always have to understand that to mean that it's not really the thing after all. Um, but, you know, but, uh, but I think obviously the government is seriously uh, interested in having uh, a, a, a legal system that uh, solves at least, you know, uh, that solves disputes uh, you know, effectively and competently and according to the law that the government itself has promulgated, you know, unless they have some special interest in the case. You know, you know for example, in the Bo Lai case um, or, or in the trial um, of his wife. I mean, clearly those uh, uh, trials, those proceedings uh, and, and the outcomes, uh, it seems to me, beyond dispute, were directed uh, from above. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can see the difference between uh, Bo Xi Lai, who gets to show up in court, you know, dressed in his normal uh, clothes, and every other defendant in a, a murder trial, uh, like, no, sorry, Bo Xi Lai was not a murder trial, but every other defendant in a trial of that, uh, uh, in, in any kind of trial, is going to show up in a, you know, in a prison jumpsuit. Um, so the government has an interest in, in, in building a, you know, a a better legal system than it has now. But um, at the same time, um, you know, they don't want to give up their control over how it functions. So I think that there is no, um, there is no prospect at all that the government intends to establish a legal system which is independent of, um, of the state. Uh, you know, there's no separation of powers in China. Um, the party has consistently and I think sincerely denied any um, attraction to that concept and any ambition to implement it. So I don't see any reason for thinking that a true separation of powers will ever be implemented uh, in China under the current uh, government. So it won't be there in the legal system right. either. Now, what they could do and uh, what is possible to do, I think, is to make the legal system, and in particular courts and judges, uh, more independent of local government. Um, uh, so, for example, uh, you know, after the Meiji Restoration in Japan, Japan managed to build a uh, legal system that was by no means, uh, you know, populated by uh, ACLU liberals um, and uh, was full of authoritarian type people because Japan did not have a, a democracy then. But nevertheless, it was uh, it was centralized, and so the government exercised its control over the judiciary and over the court system from the top, uh, and not from the side, as it were, further down in the uh, government hierarchy. And I don't see any um, uh, inherent reason why China could not uh, ultimately do the same thing, why they could not develop a more uh, you know, professionalized uh, civil service type judiciary that had autonomy from uh, local officials who were constantly trying to tell them what to do, while nevertheless not having autonomy at the top, because that's not something I think we can expect to happen. Mm -hmm. 
So this really speaks to the these two twin goals or mm -hmm. pillars of this reform that he kind of stated. Mm -hmm. One, that he wants the legal system to be seen as a more like legit legitimate, um, smoothly functioning system in China, but secondly, he still wants to maintain control over, or the party still wants mm -hmm. to maintain control over, you know, every aspect of the legal apparatus. Do you think that those two are compatible, that he can, you know, the party can mm -hmm. continue to maintain this control, but it becomes a more legitimate in the eyes of the Chinese citizens? Uh, yeah, I think that could be done. I think it could be done, again, by uh, understanding the party to mean the central uh, body of the party, not local branches of the party. So it would involve taking power out of the hands of local party organizations, local party officials, um, to influence the local judiciary um, and, and centralizing it. And indeed, in the um, decision of the third plenum, they did have some language about, um, uh, some rather vague language, uh, about kind of centralizing, at least up to the provincial level, um, certain powers of financing at least and possibly appointment of courts. Um, so there is some language and some vague ideas floating around out there about um, centralized, making courts, let's say, less accountable to uh, local government. So I think that's uh, possible to do. Uh, certainly, um, you know, giving people more confidence in the uh, fairness of the justice they receive from courts, I mean, you could do that two ways. You could, like, actually deliver better justice or you could, you know, convince them that they were getting uh, better justice. And so I think both of those, um, both of those are doable. Um, in terms of convincing people, rightly or wrongly, that they're getting better justice, I think that's relatively easy to do, which is to allow the form of a fair trial to, uh, to, to operate, that is, to allow people really to choose their own lawyers, to allow people to uh, have witnesses, uh, you know, not to block witnesses from testifying, to mm -hmm. allow people to bring suits, because again, the party, you know, still controls the outcome. And so uh, I think if they, uh, I think it would be wise for them to understand that, uh, you know, it's not disastrous to, um, in fact, can be, even be beneficial to allow the appearance of a fair trial, even if you don't actually give one. Of course, actually giving one would be even better. <laughs> we can hope. <laughs> so we've noted that President Xi has expressed his intention to pursue reform, and thus I guess we can assume that you know, the party mm -hmm. intends to pursue reform. Who else within Chinese society is maybe advocating for this legal reform? Um, well, I guess first of all, I'd say you know if Xi Jinping uh, may announce his intention to pursue legal reform, um, it doesn't mean everybody within the party is going along. For example, mm -hmm. he announced his intention to you know fight corruption. Uh, you know that's going to be controversial, mm -hmm. depending on how far he fights it. <laughs> and uh, there's probably a lot of officials now who are saying, wait a minute, this is going further than we really anticipated it would. We thought he was just like you know, all the others, just making nice noises. Um, and so anything that he does, whether it's promoting legal system reform, whether it's uh, fighting corruption, um, that uh, genuinely challenges the status quo, you know, and challenges the um, power and privileges of certain groups, you know, is going to be uh, controversial. So I believe that depending on the step, I mean, he may not take any steps to threaten anybody, you know, that remains mm -hmm. yet to be seen. I don't, uh, you know, I, I'm a little bit skeptical of the image of Xi as a reformer. I just want to see it first. I don't want to assume that everyone that comes into power is a reformer mm -hmm. uh, and is somehow being stymied by conservatives in the party, which is sort of the, a very common narrative. I want to see it uh, first. So uh, we'll, we'll see what he actually does. But in terms of who are the other sectors in society that uh, would uh, support legal reform, um, I think, uh, first of all, there's a lot of uh, you know, academics at least legal academics that are pushing for legal reform. One might say, how much power do legal academics have? They have a little more influence in Chinese society than they do in American society. Mm -hmm. um, many uh, you know, legal academics have uh, popular blogs that uh, have a big following. Hu Wei Fang uh, is one such person. Um, although, although I guess he just recently gave up uh, blogging and, uh, and tweeting, again, a sort of a mm -hmm. sign of the times. Uh, and of uh, maybe some limits on Xi's reformist uh, ambitions, given that whatever he may say, he is also the leader at a time when more and more public intellectuals are dropping out of public discourse because they feel pressured uh, to do so. Um, uh, 
I, I'm not sure um, to what extent the kind of uh, rich business class sort of, the, you know, would support continued legal reform. Um, in a sense, there's a large group of influential people in China who kind of benefit from the way things are. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if we were to talk about people on the bottom of society, uh, uh, they would benefit from a, uh, you know, a healthier uh, legal system, one in which they could get more of a, uh, you know, a ready um, uh, remedy for deprivations of their rights. Um, but these people don't have a lot of influence in, uh, in Chinese society. So, I mean, that's an interesting question, and you've made me think about mm. the degree to which there is a lot of support for legal reforms. And maybe, you know, maybe it, there, there isn't some obvious powerful social constituency, you know, mm -hmm. behind legal reforms. I think there's a general sense among many people, which may indeed be true, that uh, further economic development is going to require uh, a more kind of robust legal system that offers, uh, you know, more predictable and in particular, uh, you know, more independent uh, results. Mm -hmm. But that's a kind of a, it's hard to find a constituency behind that general view. Mm -hmm. I guess just to conclude quickly, mm -hmm. but to follow up with that question, mm -hmm. do we see the kind of mass movements in China like we see with, you know, corruption mm -hmm. um, about legal reform? Maybe like in the rural areas, mm -hmm. when somebody has a bad experience within the legal apparatus, do they turn, you know, to protesting and does it get caught up in the mass movements? Yeah, I don't know. The short answer would be no. Okay. Uh, I don't see that kind of, um, uh, you know, mass movement, mass enthusiasm. I mean, it's because I suppose many of the goals of legal reform are uh, individually, if you understand them individually, they're quite modest or else they're quite vague. You know, more independence for judges, I mean, that would be a great idea. Mm -hmm. But, you know, how exactly do you quantify it and how do you get out on the street to demonstrate for it? You know, you can get out on the street to demonstrate against corrupt officials right. because you just found out that, you know, the government claims that Zhou Yong Kang, you know, and, and his friends, relatives and cronies had 45 billion you know, dollars of uh, ill-gotten gains. I mean, that's going to get people, you know, angry and out on the street, but kind of, you know, an individual judge who's <laughs> following orders and issues an unjust opinion. I mean, yes, mm -hmm. that's annoying, but it's hard to get a big crowd of people mm. out on the street about it. That's really interesting. Well, unfortunately, we're out of mm. time today, but I just wanted to again thank you for joining me and helping us work through this issue and just to better understand this complicated part of, you know, China and Chinese society. And I want to thank you all for joining us at home. We'll see you next time on China Forum.